today is a very special day. It's great to see all of you in the house of the Lord. Aren't you glad to see the songsters leading us in song today? Yay! We're glad you're here. If you will, turn in your hymnal to number 170. Number 170, we'll sing all three verses of Oh How I Love Jesus. the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, please. Welcome to the house of the Lord. It's great to see each and every one of you on this beautiful Resurrection Sunday. Can you hear me? And then some. All right. Do I need to get rid of this? We're, we're ringing or can y'all can y'all hear me? Okay, good. All right. Uh, oh, very good. I hope that you got a bulletin when you came in. I also hope uh, that you've had a chance to sign in the registration pads. If you haven't signed in the registration pads, uh, please uh, get that little blue book at the end of the pew and uh, sign your name and any information that we need to know about you. And also there are little boxes that you can check in order uh, to, to let us know how your church can serve you well. Uh, do let us know if you'll be with us for... Uh, for Wednesday night supper, and so we, we can make sure that we have enough food for everybody for Wednesday night supper. I do want to highlight a few things you need to know. Uh, first of all, Blake is not here because he called in sick this morning, and so pray for Blake. I told him I would not make any jokes. He, he thinks he has some, uh, he thinks he has uh, uh, some food poisoning, so... So I said, stay home. We do not need you up there with a green face, okay? We do not need you up there with a green face. Uh, but we will not have youth tonight because uh, Blake is, uh, is not feeling well and won't be able to be with us tonight for youth. I do uh, want to let you know, though, that next week we begin our fall stewardship campaign. Uh, many times uh, we hear stewardship and we go, ah! 
now. I don't want people to ask me for money. So we're not going to do that, all right? Uh, I believe in no guilt stewardship campaigns, and um, our, our, uh, our leaders and finances do a very good job of making sure that uh, our, our church uh, does the most ministry we can, the most efficiently, with the most responsibility, and so uh, we, we are not in a bad financial position where we need to beg you for money. Isn't that good? Isn't that good to know? Uh, but uh, we all want to be able to invest in God's work in every way. Uh, we're in a beautiful sanctuary that was built by people who had a vision over a hundred years ago to provide us this place to worship in. And they knew that uh, they wouldn't be here on this day for us to worship in this place. But aren't you glad for the investment that they made for us? And so uh, we have the opportunity to invest in God's kingdom for those who will be here in a hundred years and to make sure that the gospel is proclaimed. So uh, through the, the month of October, our theme will be generation to generation. And we'll be focusing on our gratitude for those who've come before us and also our opportunity uh, to, to take the mantle of the ministry of the gospel in our time and for those who will come uh, in the generations to come. So we'll talk about a different generation from Scripture throughout the month. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and all our generations will be involved. We'll have stewardship speakers from uh, teenagers up to 90 plus. And we'll have music from children and from, uh, and from adults and from older adults. And we'll have a great time uh, celebrating how uh, God has blessed us and is blessing us. And, uh, and will bless and use us for a long, long time. And uh, I hope that you'll mark your calendars for October 27th. That's our Commitment Sunday. And on Commitment Sunday, we'll stick around after Sunday school and we'll have a big meal in the Wesley Center. So we're going to have barbecue and we're all going to eat together and, and celebrate uh, our commitment to one another to proclaim the gospel and to do God's work in our community in the year to come. Uh, also, um, I am completing my study of the creed tonight. So even if you haven't been coming, you can come. But if you have been coming to the study, make sure to come tonight. We've had a great time all month long talking about the meaning of the Apostles' Creed and, and how we can celebrate that and we can proclaim it as an act of faith. And so uh, remember that tonight we have the Creed study at 5 o'clock, and it is the completion of that series. So uh, Emily's going to come and lead us in a time of prayer. we know that every good and perfect gift is a blessing from you and you have blessed us with so much we ask that you use us to be a blessing to others who are in need or facing difficulties make us a channel of your blessing a channel through whom your love peace and joy flow from you through us and out to others may we be your hands to bless others may you guide our feet to places where we are needed May our words be words of comfort and encouragement and help us to speak the truth in love. And give us the grace to be available when others are in need. Lord, that you may increase in our lives and we may decrease, so that the blessings you pour through us to others may draw us closer 
into the arms of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Will you nurture your son in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? I will. Congregation, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ Will you nurture one another in, Christ, in the Christian life and faith? And will you include this child now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Robert with a community of love and forgiveness. And he may be a true disciple. It walks in the way that leads to life. Hi. What name is given to this child? Robert Burke. Robert Burke. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Members of the household of faith, I commend to your love and care for Robert, whom we this day recognize as a member of the family of God. Will you endeavor so to live that Robert may grow in the knowledge and love of God through our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ? Surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. Amen. We invite our children to come forward for the children's minute. 
Oh, we got music oh, first. Okay. I'm sorry. I got in a hurry. Well, that's <laughs> I'm sorry. Go that's ahead, okay. guys.
And now we invite the children to come forward for the children's minute. Come on, guys. Here they come. Here they come. I know, man. It's the best part. Good morning. How are y'all this morning? Good. Let me tell you what. Come on down, girls. I brought a special guest with me this morning. He's a little shy, though. Let me go get him. He has the most beautiful voice in the whole world. Miss Judy's going to want him in the choir. Mr. Richard's going to love playing for him. I just love him. Let me get my special guest. Oh, my. <laughs> Bo, who is this? Yeah, that's why Bo is in third grade. To get out of my second grade class, you got to know who Elvis is. I brought Elvis with me this morning. I just love him. He's my boyfriend, but don't tell Mr. Chuck, okay? <laughs> I love to hear him sing. He sings beautifully, and I love it. Have you ever thought about that you would like to trade places with someone else? Listen, when I grow up, I'm going to be a backup singer for Elvis. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I can do that blue Christmas one. But you know what? Would you like to change place with a famous athlete? Like, let me think of some. Uh, Brady, oh, I almost said Brady Donaldson, but he's kind of famous yes. around here, isn't he? Yes. Tom Brady or Tim Tebow. Or what about uh, somebody that's got lots of money like Bill Gates? Yeah, wouldn't you like to trade? But they all went, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, wouldn't you like to trade places with him? Well, you know what? Would you like to trade place with that homeless man that's out there in front of Walmart? What did I say? A homeless person? Would you like to trade places with a homeless person? Well, I want to tell you what. I'm going to have to lay Elvis down. Elvis has been through it in my room. He's kind of old. That's what our story is about today. Trading places with someone that you think you never would trade places with. And that's exactly what happened in the Bible. Uh, God, tell, Jesus tells us a story about a rich man and Lazarus. Now, the rich man, he lived in a fine house and wore beautiful, fine clothes, and he ate the best meals around, had great food to eat. Lazarus was a beggar that sat outside in front of his gate and he would beg for food when the man would walk by. All he wanted was some scraps that was left over from whatever he ate, and he was a sick man. But do you think that that rich man paid any attention to, that, to Lazarus? No. no, he just walked on by and acted like he didn't even see him. He didn't. Well, one day, Lazarus died and went to heaven. And one day, the rich man died, but he didn't go to heaven. He didn't. And he thought to himself, uh, Lazarus, here he was, but he trusted God to take care of him. And God did. He sent his angels and took him to heaven with him. But the rich man, he didn't need anybody. He had everything he needed, or he thought he did. And so he wouldn't have what Lazarus had. And so he wanted to trade places now with Lazarus because Lazarus was in heaven. He trusted God, Lazarus did. So the, I think about this story, what is it teaching us? That w who do we put our trust in? Do we put our trust in God or do we put our trust in ourselves? We want to put our trust in God because if we do, then we have the wonderful things of life. And we don't want to be wishing that we had to trade places with someone else because we know that God takes care of us if we trust him. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Dear Jesus, we just thank you that you give us the opportunity to trust you, that you will take care of all our needs and all our wants. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. And you can go to Children's Church. As the children go to Children's Church, I invite our ushers to come forward for our morning tithes and offerings. And as we prepare to give our tithes and offerings, I, I just want to share. 
share something um, that our church is able to give this week. Um, we hosted the funeral for Virginia Thomas this week and um, we prepared a family meal for them. And when the family asked um, what the cost would be, um, because of your faithful giving, we were able to share with the family that um, our church offers this to families in loss um, just as our way to share the love of Christ. So I just wanted to say thank you again for your faithful giving, and it really does touch the lives of so many people. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. You are an abundant God, and out of your great mercy, you have given us so much. We bring our tithes and offerings to you today, and with it we worship you and give our whole selves to you. We ask that you make it a great blessing to many for your kingdom and your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Preparation is number 431 in your hymnal. I invite you to turn in your hymnal to 431. We'll sing all the verses of Let There Be Peace on Earth.
Please remain standing for the gospel reading. Our gospel reading comes today from the gospel according to Luke. I invite you to turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 16. And we will read today from the 19th verse through the end of the chapter. Listen for God's word as we share it together today. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things. Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so. No one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, please. Last week's parable was a difficult one. It was a story of the, I call him the crooked manager, the dishonest manager, the unjust steward is the traditional name for that story about a crook. That Jesus says we should be like that crook. And I understand that the Sunday school classes that talked about the story of the unjust steward um, were confused. That's good. I'm glad. If you were confused by God's Word, then you were paying attention. Many times we take what the Bible says and we dumb it down to a level that makes it easy for us. Uh, But the Bible is intended to cause us to wrestle, to put that grain of sand in the oyster that that disrupts until it's turned into the pearl. Um, Jesus' disciples wanted him to simplify it for him too. They said, Jesus, you keep telling us these parables. You keep telling us these parables, and we don't know what you're talking about. Will you just tell us plainly? Tell us plainly. And Jesus said, nope, not going to do it. Not going to do it. And so um, we, we are coming to the end of this series on parables Rightly reading the parables as uh, not simplistic, moralistic tales um, that give us a, a little morsel, a little moral that helps us to live as slightly nicer people in the world, but as complex and difficult uh, visions of God's world being contrary to our world. Um, difficult stories that cause us to look from different vantage points and begin to imagine things differently. Uh, Stories that remake us on the inside. Jesus tells this story, which is as tough as any of them, 
Not because we don't understand what it means, but we don't want to believe that it means what it says. Okay? All right? Uh, <laughs> this difficult story happens because um, back in a time when people had not yet become so reverential of Jesus, they didn't catch what he was saying. That's what we are. We're so reverential of Jesus that we don't catch what he says. But back in a time when people had not yet become reverential of Jesus, the religious people are making fun of Jesus. They're laughing at Jesus for his teachings. Verse 14, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all this. And this is the parable from last week. And they ridiculed him. They ridiculed him. Why would they laugh at Jesus for what he said? Here's why. Here's why. Because much of Old Testament theology teaches this. That if you follow God's laws, if you do things God's way, if you align your life with the principles that God has laid down in his world, then God will bless you. God will bless you. Not only in the world to come, but also in this world. Right? Obedience leads to earthly blessing. Many times in the Old Testament, when things go poorly for the people of Israel, they say, why has this happened? Why did this thing happen? And the answer is, you've been punished because you didn't follow God's law. And so there are blessings and cursings. There are uh, good things that come from good behavior, and then there are consequences for poor behavior. And we all understand that, and that's true, and that's biblical, and this is the way we teach our children, right? Yes. Yes, however. 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 That kind of thinking, if you take it as absolute, can become a cover for greed. It says, if I, if I do everything like I'm supposed to, then I'm going to acquire earthly blessings and I'm going to have things and I'm going to be blessed as the world defines blessings. And so I can quickly begin to use my faith as a tool to get stuff that has nothing to do with the righteousness of God. It can become a cover for greed. And that's what had happened with the Pharisees. And even worse than that, even worse than that, is if I get too locked into that mindset, I can develop a tendency to look down on the poor. To say, well, if God blesses those who do right, and if there are consequences for doing wrong, then if somebody is poor, or somebody's going through a tough time, or some terrible thing has befallen a person, then they must be responsible for that situation. It must be their fault. And if they had been a good, righteous person like me, then they'd be doing good like me. Right? And that is a very dangerous way to think. And so Jesus tells a story to turn the mockery on the religious types. He tells a story to demonstrate that it is the Pharisees and not Jesus who have constructed a theology that is absurd, that is a mockery of what God always intended in the law and in the prophets. He brings them back to the heart of Scripture And beyond what the Bible teaches about blessings and cursings, which is certainly true and is certainly important, beyond that is a more fundamental truth, and it is this, that God has made every human being in His image and likeness. That every human being on the face of the earth no matter what they've done, no matter what their circumstances, no matter who they are, no matter how close, no matter how far, each and every human being is precious in God's sight. Each and every human being is a unique creation of God, a beloved child of God, a gift of God's heart, a gift of God's imagination. 
with whom we will share eternity, potentially, an eternal home, potentially, as children of one Father. And so, to dismiss anyone, to mistreat anyone, to dehumanize anyone, to condemn anyone, to overlook anyone, to categorize anyone, to demonize any person is a violation of the very heart of God. It is a violation of the core of the heart of God's word. It is violence against the heart of God and those he has created in his image and likeness. Here's the story, Jesus says. There's two men. One man is not named the rich man. The rich man. He has everything that could be desired in this life. Fine home, food and supply, luxurious goods. The servants feed him his meals. And then there's another man who is named. His name is Lazarus. The only person who gets a name in any parable. Isn't that worth thinking about? Hmm. Lazarus sits at his gate. And he has nothing. His stomach is empty. His heart is broken. He lives in shame. His body is wounded. And every day, the rich man, after he's had his breakfast, he's off to work, he steps around and does all he can do not to notice Lazarus. To walk around him. To not see him. How hard must he work day after day after day after year after year after year to not notice this man whose residence is the sidewalk in front of his house. Jesus says they both die and in death, in the afterlife, and I will say that if you take this as a description of the afterlife, it gets awfully confusing. This is a parable, folks. All right? That is beside the point. It's a parable. But in the next life, they are separated by a vast chasm, Jesus says. Lazarus is comforted in the arms of Father Abraham, and the rich man is tormented. And he asks, Father Abraham, I am in torment. Have Lazarus dip his, his finger in water so that he can cool my tongue. Huh. And he says, it can't be done. It can't happen. The rich man says, well, send Lazarus. Send Lazarus to my brothers so that they can avoid what has happened to me and Abraham says, they've already received a message. They've already received a messenger. They have the law and the prophets. I'd like for us to, to wrestle with this parable a little bit. And let's do it this way. Let's each of us try to imagine ourselves in the place of each of the major characters in the story. Imagine yourself to be Lazarus. That's probably not the person you picked when you heard the story. But it's the right place to start. We're not likely to identify with the poor beggar at the door. But the gospel begins not with the requirement upon us, but by the action of God. And the thing that we've got to establish first before we figure out how we are to respond to what God does, what God's like, is to say, what does God do? What is God like? What is God's heart? Everything that we do is in grateful response to God. Not in condemnation for the thing that we should have done that we didn't. And so, I think the place to start is to say, 
that God is rich, but He's not like this rich man. Right? God has all things, but He doesn't use them the way that this rich man handles his goods. God is not like the rich man in this story. God gives Lazarus a name. How often are the poor in this world nameless? Anonymous. How many times do we we recognize the poor people around us? And yet, their names are unknown to us. We celebrate the names of the people who have the things of earth. But we minimize those who are poor in the things of the earth. God's not like that. God gives Lazarus a name. God gives the overlooked and the hurting eternal comfort. And the gospel teaches us that we are the beggar at the door. That even if we try to betray our, the truth of, our, of our, our nature through the things of earth and we try to pack our lives with enough stuff to pretend that we're okay in and of ourselves, the reality is that we are ashamed of our wounds and we are hungry with a hunger that can't be satisfied of anything of this world and that we are lost without the help of a God who loves us in the state that he finds us. God has found us sitting at His door and He has named us and He has cared for us and the Scripture tells us that He fills the hungry with good things. He knows our name. He counts the hairs of our head. God has not overlooked you. He has seen you through your poverty and through your shame, through your brokenness and through your need, and He has loved you as a beloved child. Well, let's try the story out from another point of view. What's it like for us to think of the story with ourselves being the rich man? The rich man. You may say, I'm not very rich. Well, comparatively, if you are in this room, you are rich. Compared to the rest of the people in this world, you are rich. So be honest with yourself. Do you have people in your life that you look away from? A couple weeks ago, I had a meeting in Atlanta. And I, I had to leave after Wednesday night supper. So I was pulling in Atlanta late. Late, Right? And I'm following the little machine. The little machine's like, turn left here. I'm like, are you sure you want me to turn here? (laughs) Okay, I'm turning there. And I came to the stoplight, and here comes a man. And it's like 11 o'clock at night. And and he's, he's, he's looking for financial assistance the people at the stoplight, and I'm like this, looking straight ahead. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, turn green, turn green, turn green. <laughs> Confession time. I, mean, I was like, when that light, turn light turned green, I was like, okay, good, let's go. So I have a feeling I might not be the only one. How many people in my life do I dehumanize? How many people do I see, not with God's eyes, but I see as kind of objects? That I think of them in terms of their role or their relation to me instead of being a person with their own integrity. There's all kinds of people like that. It's not just poor people. It's not just people who might be dangerous. It might be people whose politics that are different than mine, whose religion is different than mine. It may be people who I know who have done me wrong and I have come to see as an obstacle. This is what Jesus' parable teaches us, is that things aren't real. Not really real. They're real, but they're temporary. People are real. People are permanent in relationships. That's what's real. 
How easy is it to begin to use people to push our agenda? How easy is it then to overlook people when they, when they are not useful to us? Or to fear people when they feel like they might be dangerous to us for any reason, for a variety of reasons? That's the heart of the rich man's problem. The rich man's problem isn't primarily that he, that he is not generous to Lazarus, but that he sees him as a tool or not a useful tool. So even, even on the other side of this life, what does he say? Hey, have Lazarus run an errand for me. Have Lazarus dip his hand in the water. You know, ha- have him serve me, Abraham. Well, that can't do. Okay, well have Lazarus go back and tell my brothers. He only, even on the other side, can see Lazarus as a person who is useful to him. A tool Never as a human being. God doesn't look at us that way. He doesn't look at you that way. People are the agenda in God's kingdom. And relationships and love are the thing that lasts in God's world. And it's the rich man's inability to see Lazarus as a real person that fixes the chasm. And that chasm between the rich man and Lazarus in the next life didn't begin in the next life. That chasm was established by the rich man every time he stepped over Lazarus as he walked out of his stoop. And God wants to close the chasms between us. This story is not about money. There are fine people with money and there are greedy people with money. And there are fine people with no money and there are greedy people with no money. The question is, what serves what in your life? What's life really about? What are people for? There's one other character that I want you to try out this morning in this story, and that is the brothers. And I really think that's who we are in the story, is we're the brothers. We're the brothers who have been given this witness and have been given this opportunity. And the question is, if one rises from the dead and tells them, will they hear? And one has risen from the dead. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and He has offered us this message, this warning, this opportunity. We have the Scriptures. And the question is, Will we have their word? Will we twist God's word to serve our purpose, our agenda? Will we mock those who offer the truth? Can I give you just one practical step? It's simple. Ooh, but it's so hard. Can I give you a to-do for this week? Just try it. Just try it. One of the ways that we turn people into objects and we wrestle with them in terms of whether they're going to serve our agenda or block our agenda and not treat them as human beings is to talk about them, to criticize them. Okay? I want you to try something this week. Just as a one little thing to try out the heart of this passage Try for one week, one week, don't criticize anybody. Don't criticize anybody. Just try it. It's just an experiment. Now, who counts as anybody? Anybody? The people who live in your house, do they count? Okay, all right. Um, The people who live in Washington, do they count? 
Oh, just one kind. <laughs> Everybody. The referees, do they count? <laughs> There's somebody too. <laughs> Sometimes I'm in a football game and I, I hear people talking about the coach and I'm like, there's something about being a coach that's like being a pastor. <laughs> when I listen to the commentary. <laughs> okay? Anybody. You don't have to do it forever. Why don't you just like go cold turkey for a week, next week, go on Twitter, go on Facebook, whatever you want to do. Just chew them up, spit them out, but just try it. Wouldn't it be fun to see what it'd be like? I'm not going to objectify anybody for a week. Anybody. The guy who drops the pass. You know, the guy in front of me in traffic. Oh, that's going to be hard for me. I'm like, you know, <laughs> that's going to be rough for me. I've always got a little running commentary on the driving ability of the other motorists. You know, that one's going to be hard for me. That's going to be rough. All right. No, not your coworker, not your grandchild, not, not your parents, particularly not those who deserve it. All right? Can, can we just try it? I mean, just one week, see what it does. Would that be fun? Who will take the seven day challenge? No criticizing anybody. Who'll do it? Some people are like, not on your life. <laughs> not on your life. No, man, I cannot go 20 minutes without talking about Nancy Pelosi, okay? <laughs> She's a person, too. She's a person, too, you know? You know? She's a person, too, you know? I'm, talking, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, you know? I'm telling you. Everybody's a person. Everybody. Who's a person? Everybody. Everybody, everybody, who does God love? Everybody, everybody, yeah. And we might learn more by our inability to do this than we do by doing it successfully. We might learn something about what's in our heart. And we might discover our own wound. And we might discover that God has grace and riches for people who are wounded in soul like we are. Okay? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 593. I invite you to stand as we sing. Here I am, Lord. As we sing, the altar is open. And you are invited to come home to your Father.
Christ goes with 